Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Baumgartner. That was a wonderful introduction from Matt. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about some lessons I've learned from the past few years of doing applied natural language processing. Um, I work at RTI International, which is a large nonprofit research institute. We work with state and local governments, government agencies, nonprofits, foundations, um, a lot of different clients and companies to really help solve their problems through science and research. And so a lot of this talk, it's not technical and it comes from that consulting background, but even if you're in a, a product-oriented company, I think there's something in here for you. So what we're going to talk about today are how to identify good applied natural language processing problems and partners. Uh, once you've done that, how do you successfully apply and deliver natural language processing? And finally, how do we make the world of applied natural language processing easier in the future for others? Um, just some presentation logistics before I continue. My last slide has a link and a QR code to all the resources I'm going to talk about today. So you're welcome to take pictures if any slides really catch your fancy, but just know that all those are collected and curated at the end of this presentation. So what do I mean by applied natural language processing? I take a data kind of driven approach, which is that if you're using natural language processing on a data set that's not a standard benchmark or a well-documented example, you're probably doing applied natural language processing. So just some generic examples of things that I've done. We've used BERT to classify free text survey responses into categories, just a simple classification task. Um, we've used word embeddings on specific domain corpuses to identify slang terms by their similarity. And even something as simple as using name entity recognition to pull private information out of comments so that they can be displayed publicly, I would call that applied natural language processing. Uh, to get into just some other idea of the data that we're using and data that I've used, um, here's some examples. Uh, these are all mostly in English. And just to give some project examples, um, the talk that Matt had uh, mentioned, uh, that was where we used news articles. We worked with the Bureau of Justice Statistics in the United States to run a pilot study to see if we could identify articles that mentioned arrest-related deaths and use those articles at, in a pipeline to fill out and um, autocomplete a survey for law enforcement agencies so that we could collect those official statistics. Um, some other things that we do is we use social media data to better understand how e-cigarette companies are marketing to youth in the United States. So the first thing I want to talk about is how do you identify good problems for applied natural language processing? And more importantly, how do you find good partners and clients to work with? And through my experience, I found that there's one really important question to ask and get into a discussion with your stakeholders with right away. And that question is, how would you solve this problem without natural language processing? And when I've asked this question, usually the responses fall into one of six kind of archetypes or stereotypes that I'll talk about. And those have different implications for how you should treat the project going forward. So the first is Anodyne Andy. Anodyne Andy does not even think about things in terms of problems and solutions. He just heard that you do something with text, and now he wants to talk to you to figure out what he can do. Um, and so what Anodyne Andy needs is examples of applied natural language processing projects, what it can and can't do, the types of tasks that are relevant. Um, encourage them to start thinking about the business context that you'll implement or um, some process that you'll change the decision making of once you have some natural language processing solution. And finally, you should probably take a look at Andy's data to make sure that you'll be able to do anything that you're talking about um, initially. EasyEd wants other options. So EasyEd's answer to this question would be, well, is there something else we should do? Um, and a lot of times these projects kind of pop up unexpectedly. And so this is based off a, a real, ex real life example that I had where a client came to me, said, Peter, we need some like heavy duty natural language processing. I said, okay, like what, what's the deal here? And it turns out all they had was a bunch of PDFs. They already had a database and they just wanted to put the PDFs in the database. So I instructed them about tools to do that. And um, the real uh, benefit there was I showed them how to turn on the full text search functionality in their database. And that was awesome. That was perfect for them and what they needed. So oftentimes, your client might just need data collection or data management help. Um, and the benefit there is that later on, if they do have a more complex natural language processing project, you're the one who's set up the initial data management. And so you're going to have an easy time getting in there and doing more robust work. All right, next is Show Off Sarah. Show Off Sarah just wants to do AI, okay? Um, I hear some laughing, so everyone probably knows a Show Off Sarah. 
Um, so Shroff Sarah comes to you and they're like, yes, I want to do AI. And they have the inverse problem, which is they have a solution in search of a problem. And so um, what, what you need to do when interacting with these people is clearly outline the limitations of natural language processing, talk about the data quality necessary to do some specific tasks, and give them examples of problems that have been solved. And so hopefully that should bring them down to earth. Um, the thing to watch out for is that they might just dump a data set on you and expect you to just turn it into something valuable. Um, I've had that happen a number of times. And so watch out for that and be really clear about what you're proposing to do and what natural language processing can and can't do. All right, next is a Helpful HANA. So Helpful HANA has structured data, which is awesome. So Helpful HANA would say, yeah, I'd solve that problem with this other structured data set that we've got here, and I wouldn't look at the text or natural language data at all. And so Helpful HANA might need some data management help in the sense that you could maybe take the text that um, you've got and combine it with the structured data that you have. This is particularly valuable if there's some way to combine the row-level structured data that they have with some document-level information that you're working with. And that way, it gives you a, an opportunity to sort and filter and group by on these metadata variables um, that will allow you to better understand the problem and the context by which that language data is generated. Uh, they might also need a supplemental analysis. So a lot of times, if they already have structured data, since you can group by or sort by those other data fields, um, they might just need something simple. Um, you know, word clouds are much hated, but you can make a word cloud. Uh, you can just, a lot of times, they just need like an n-gram analysis to complement their structured data. Um, and that can be enough to provide value for them. All right, Labeling Larry has labeled data. So I, I work with a lot of social scientists. And um, through my experience working with social scientists, I've discovered that they have a process for data labeling. Um, they just call it qualitative coding or content analysis. And um, so I've worked with a lot of these people who they use these qualitative coding software. And um, what they do is they go through documents and text, and they'll highlight paragraphs and label certain things. And they're doing it through this kind of clunky software. And so in a lot of cases, they've already labeled data for you. And you can take that and turn it into some machine learning pipeline without a lot of work. And that could be really valuable for them. So it's good to show them examples of what you can do with that labeled data. Now, it might not be exactly what you need for a structured natural language processing task. But the benefit here is that they're already familiar with the labor required to do data labeling and um, annotation. So they're not going to kind of freak out when you say, oh, yeah, can you just go redo that task, and, um, but do it this way. They're already familiar with that labor involved. Um, they might also need some data management. A lot of times, the software that they use for qualitative coding is kind of old and clunky, and they're not using any sort of natural language processing technology in there. So that's an opportunity to really help them out and um, show them what natural language processing can do with data that they're familiar with. All right, finally, best case scenario is you've got a prepared PAM. So a prepared PAM usually doesn't start here unless it's someone that you've talked to before, uh, someone that you've had a conversation with, you've asked this question, and you both kind of mutually agree that the only way to go forward with solving this specific problem is with some advanced natural language processing techniques. And so at this stage, the best thing to do is trust but verify. Get your hands on the data and make sure that you're going to be able to solve the problem that you think you're solving with that data that they have. OK, so next let's talk about project delivery. Let's say you've identified a pretty good applied natural language processing project. You've got a nice partner to work with you, and you're looking to, to start on the project. Um, a lot of times in the consulting world, a lot, uh, this next thing happens. So you get a, a no pay raise promotion. You're now also a project manager or a task lead or a product owner, or at least you report to one of the above. And so especially in product organizations, a lot of times people's experience with um, machine learning and managing natural language processing projects um, is pretty low. It's even less rare in a consulting environment due to kind of the, the spread of skills. So that person is now you. And not to make that job any harder, but um, natural language processing and machine learning projects are unique in their requirements. Um, I believe this was put pretty eloquently by Pete Skomarok in a, in a recent talk. He said that uh, machine learning kind of shifts uh, project management and engineering from a deterministic process to a probabilistic one. 
And so now, since it's probabilistic, you've got this uncertainty around all these experiments you're going to run. And it turns out that uncertainty makes people really uncomfortable and unsure, and they don't really like it. And so these are now your clients that you have to communicate this uncertainty to. And that's just the nature of the game. These projects are inherently uncertain. Uh, but there are ways around that that um, we'll talk about. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is brush up on your project management skills. So I would highly recommend this book, uh, Project Management for the Unofficial Project Manager. It doesn't include a lot of the BS and stuff about project management and PMOs. It's literally like, if you're in this situation where you're now managing a project, here's the quick start guide to doing that. Um, it's got a lot of tools and some fun narratives about project management. And um, one of the nice tools in there that they have is this project status report. And what it is is just a log of all of your deliverables, everything you're going to deliver, all the products you're going to make, kind of your milestones, and some traditional benchmarks like when you're going to do it, is it on track, that sort of thing. And one of the things that I've done successfully with clients to communicate this uncertainty is take that project status report and combine it with this idea that I need to communicate that we're in an experimental arena and turn it into an experiment log. And so this experiment log come, becomes how you track your own work and how you communicate with stakeholders. And it helps reduce some of that uncertainty around um, some of the uncomfortableness around that uncertainty. And so you can track things like the name of the experiment, whether it's on track in terms of schedule, what the utility of that completing that experiment would be, kind of what the value is, your confidence that that will be successful or unsuccessful, and what the actual result was. And this goes a long way towards showing you know what you're doing. You're not out there in experimental land, not communicating your results. And I found clients really like this, and it helps you just kind of manage around the, the uncomfortableness of uncertainty and communicate effectively. So eventually, one of the things you're going to need to do is communicate what you've actually done or what, you, what natural language processing is to outside stakeholders. And I think, actually, the process of building metaphors is an underused tool in communicating to non-technical stakeholders. Um, one of the best metaphors I have seen is in this article by Cassie Kozarkov. Um, she's the chief decision officer or scientist at, at Google. And she wrote this fantastic article about why businesses fail at machine learning. And she used the metaphor of a kitchen. And her thesis was that most businesses fail because they're hiring people who are engineers who build the appliances for the kitchen. And what they really need are people who are cooks, who are familiar with the recipes, who can use the appliances to make dishes for their customers. And so that was a very effective metaphor to illustrate this point. Um, and has a lot of application to doing machine learning in business. Now, metaphors don't have to be this kind of scary, mystical black box process. You can put some structure around it, and there can be a definite process for coming up with these metaphors. Uh, this was illustrated to me by this fantastic talk at uh, the TomTom -Tom Machine Learning Festival this year by Ali Torben. Uh, she walked through her process for creating visual metaphors, uh, their connection to data visualization, and most importantly, she published her slides in a nice one-pager on just what her process is. And so you can go through this in a nice, structured way and think about what you're trying to communicate and come up with really brilliant and vibrant metaphors for um, natural language processing and what you're trying to do. Another helpful tool I found are these really interesting um, nature cards from the design firm IDEO. And what they are are these, um, they're a set of about 20 cards that describe kind of complex ecological processes. And they're actually meant to come up with analogies and metaphors for design problems. But I found them really successful in thinking about natural language processing problems and just wider project problems. And so these are a great way to kind of look to nature for inspiration and in coming up with metaphors and communicating what's going on. OK, so finally, I want to talk about how do we make applied natural language processing easier for others in the future? How do we do some trailblazing? And before I kind of talk about that, I need to talk about the differences between research and applied natural language processing. So I view natural language processing research as kind of like going on a really long backcountry hike, going on an expedition, going out and exploring. And when you come back from that hike, when you come back from that trip exploring, you're going to communicate to everyone what you've done and all the cool sites you saw and what you've learned. Applied natural language processing is more like building and maintaining trails for others to experience the beauty of nature. 
Now, one of the issues that comes up here is that I feel like natural language processing researchers have a good outlet and a venue for communicating their work, right? So we have journal proceedings, uh, we've got conference proceedings and peer reviewed journals. Uh, applied natural language processing, it feels a little awkward in kind of sharing our work and our workflows and the problems we've solved. And so what I would like to propose is that um, we need to communicate what we do in applied natural language processing a lot more, how we're solving problems, what works and what doesn't work. And I believe the way to do that is through blogging. And so the <laughs> people are laughing, but I'm serious. Um, I think everyone should blog more often. A great place to start is this blog post by uh, Rachel Thomas from Fast AI. She walks through her own reluctance towards blogging. She provides some great tips to getting started with blogs, some examples of how to structure blog posts. Um, it's a really fantastic place to get started. Now, you don't need to feel like you need to write a whole thesis on applied natural language processing or what you've done. Uh, there's this very timely blog post by Matthew Rockland, known for his work on the Dask library. He says, write short blog posts. And I think that's actually great advice. A lot of times, we don't need to build the whole trail to expose to others. A lot of times, we just need some signage to point the way. Now, if you're dealing with applied natural language processing problems, a lot of times, you have this issue with using client data or just using data that you don't have permission to share publicly. And so I would propose that we use public data, and there are some great data sources out there to do that. Um, one that I've used a lot is Kaggle. If you don't know Kaggle, they hold machine learning competitions, but they've also got this giant data sets repository. And you can just search natural language processing on there to get some fantastic data sets. Another really cool source is this newsletter from Jeremy Singer Vine called Data is Plural. Uh, every week, he sends out five really unique, uh, cool data sets. The one last week had data on wiretapping in the US. So they're not always natural language processing, but they are always interesting. And most importantly, he catalogs all them in an awesome spreadsheet. So you can just go and look up um, really interesting data sources to do your work with. Finally, there's this aptly named NLP data sets repository on GitHub that just has a bunch of uh, small, large, all sorts of uh, multi-language data sets for natural language processing. And so I would propose that if you have a problem and you have constraints around what you can and can't share, find a similar problem that you could solve with one of these data sets and apply that methodology to that data set. And beyond being able to communicate your work to others and share what you're doing, it's also going to strengthen your methodology because you're applying it to a new data set and you're going to be able to um, have a more robust analysis and better understand what's going on. So uh, I'm going to wrap up here. I, I think we do a better job of guiding others and making our workflows explicit and communicating what's going on. We hear about a lot of awesome and interesting technologies in natural language processing. And um, they're fantastic. And we've made great advances in what's going on. But um, the applied world is still hard because I don't think there's a good job. I don't think we do a good job of communicating what works and what doesn't work in the applied world. So hopefully you've learned some tools that I've covered today, how to identify good problems, how to work with stakeholders to figure out where they're at, uh, how to successfully deliver natural language processing projects. And finally, regardless of whether you succeed or fail, I hope you'll share your, share your work with us and blaze a trail for others. Thank you. <laughs>